welcome to the session on application of radiology. Uh, we have total nine presentations today. Uh, all of them are uh, short oral presentations. So we will divide that into a group of three each. Uh, each presenter will have 90 seconds to present their work. And then we will have a group discussion for 10 minutes for each group. And then we'll move to the next group. So we can start with the first presenter, which is uh, with, who is Brennan Nichiparuk. And let's wait if we can get the slides. Yes, we have the slides here. So Brennan's stage is all yours. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Uh, so my name is Brennan Nichiparuk, and I'll be presenting optimizing operating points for high-performance lesion detection and segmentation using lesion size rewind. Um, so our motivation is, in, in, in many cases, uh, we have to segment the wide range of uh, lesion sizes, particularly in diseases like um, MS and cancer. Uh, and in many cases, standard loss functions like uh, binary cross-entropy typically better segment large lesions than they segment uh, small ones. Um, so what we end up seeing is um, sort of a trade-off between uh, detection and uh, segmentation performance, which you can see on the uh, figure on the right, where we have um, at the optimal operating point for segmentation, which is the red dot, we get suboptimal performance on detection. So essentially what this means is that uh, we'll generally have um, a higher threshold for optimal segmentation performance, and we'll usually need to use a lower threshold for optimal detection performance. So really the question is, how can we use a single threshold and get optimal performance on both segmentation and detection at the same time? And to do this, we our method is uh, lesion size reweighing, and we what we do is we uh, weigh lesions as a function of their size. And we can make these operating points converge so that we can achieve optimal segmentation and detection at the same time at the same threshold. Um, and for more information, please see our uh, poster session, which is H H4. Thank, Thank you, Brennan. Uh, so the next presenter is Jun Yu Shen. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. OK, um, so I'm I'm Jong Yu Chen. Uh, I'm from Johns Hopkins University. I'm happy here uh, to present my work on creating phantom variations via uh, unsupervised convolutional neural networks. So computerized phantoms are useful in many medical image applications, including evaluating image reconstruction or processing algorithms, and even training deep neural networks for image analysis tasks. The extended four-dimensional uh, Sorry, the existing four-dimensional extended cardiac torso phantom, or XK phantom, was developed based on the anatomies of real human being. And this phantom allows simple scaling and stretching of the organ shapes to create new phantom variations. However, the simple scaling and stretching does not fully and truly capture the anatomical variations seen in humans. The existing methods uh, create better phantom variation by applying a phantom label to CT label registration. But as we all know that the manual, uh, the segmentations are very hard to obtain and matching the segmentation labels does not capture the anatomical details. So in this work, we propose to directly register XK phantom with patient CT images using a fully unsupervised uh, comp net. This method is similar to deep image prior where we treat comp net as a uh, uh, optimization tool to iteratively minimize the loss function for a given image pair. Therefore, this method does not require a prior training stage, so it is truly unsupervised. Uh, and we show that the proposed method can generate highly realistic phantoms that captures the anatomical details of human being. And combined with simulation programs, we can gener generate highly realistic medical image simulations for many medical image applications. Um, and the code for this work is public the available online and this work has been published by medical physics and you are welcome to uh, check out the full paper of this work and um, that's it thanks thank you junior uh, so our next presenter is lucas
Can you hear me properly? Yep, we can hear you, Lucas. Wonderful. Um, I am uh, Lucas. I'm a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam and uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center. And uh, in our group, we work on uh, stroke, ischemic stroke, which is one of the deadliest diseases uh, worldwide. So when a patient comes into our hospital, uh, we make a spatial temporal scan of the per uh, patient's brain. This is a four dimensional scan. And we do this to estimate, to estimate the perfusion of um, blood in the brain tissue. And from this, we want to assess uh, how large the infarct core actually is. And this infarct core is a, the size of this infarct core is a very important biomarker to determine the uh, kind of treatment that the patient will uh, undergo. So typically we use standard CTP software for this, uh, which is uh, developed by the vendor of the CT scanner. But we have, uh, it has been shown that there's a lot of discrepancy between these software packages. And this is due to an uh, algorithm which is in the core of these uh, software packages. So our goal was to go directly from the data from the CT scanner to uh, infarct core segmentation. And uh, we did so using uh, transformers because we have spatial temporal data. So because uh, transformers are the current state of the art sequential models, we wanted to make a, a data-driven method uh, for infarct core segmentation using these transformers in a very uh, simple way, actually. Um, so these transformers encode the spatial temporal correlations in this CTP data and actually map it to a spatial map of the brain, uh, which tells us something about the probability of a voxel, uh, whether it's infarcted or not. And this spatial map of the brain is then used um, combined with the first frame of the CTP sequence um, and the frame at which the contrast fluid is at the maximum to perform infarct core segmentation. And uh, with this, we actually achieved the top result for the IELTS 2018 challenge uh, when we compare to methods that uh, only use this raw CTP data uh, as an input. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lucas. So now we have some time for the questions. Feel free to post your questions in the chat. So we have a question for H4. So Brennan, we have a question for you. So the question is, do you need to know the size of the lesion for each case to allow the method to work? Um, yes, you do. And usually if you have the, um, so at least during training time, you, you do need this information. Um, so usually this can be computed directly from the lesion labels directly that you have. Um, and you'll just weigh those lesions during training um, in a manner that's um, uh, inversely proportional to the size. Um, so yes, you, you would need to know the size during training. Obviously, during evaluation, this uh, isn't necessary. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Junyu. For a multimodality case in normalized MI uh, cases, can the normalized MI be considered as a loss function component? You mean the uh, mutual information? Yeah, mutual information. Yeah. So, yeah, so computerized phantom and CT images come from uh, obviously different distributions, right? So, or you can call them different modalities. Therefore, uh, it is better to use cross modality loss function. And one thing we actually tried is mutual information. But traditionally, calculating mutual information requires uh, calculating this discrete uh, intensity histograms, right? So we are not, they are not strictly um, differentiable. And in order to make them differentiable, what we can do is sort of quantize or subsample the intensity values and then use a smoothing function to smooth out the intensity distribution. But we, what we found is that uh, there's a trade-off between the performance and the computational speed in terms of how much you subsample or quantize the intensity values. And this remains to be a, a hyperparameter. And in our case, we actually found that the, the structural, structural similarity works better than mutual information. And so our uh, implement, actual implementation is based on the structural inform, uh, structural similarity information uh, rather than mutual information. But the implementation of mutual information uh, is publicly available online. So you're welcome to check it out. Yep. 
Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question for Lucas. Uh, so do you have an indicator how much of improvement is brought by the transformers? Can we do the same without transformers? I'm sorry, I'm, I misunderstood the question, I think. Okay, so the question is that uh, if you do not use the transformers, uh, yeah. can you get what kind of performance would you achieve if you do not yeah, use the transformers? Yeah. That's actually a, a very good question. Uh, we're working on uh, spatial temporal units um, before we started uh, this project. And uh, well, uh, when we started this project, we had this uh, middle uh, short paper deadline in mind as well. Uh, so we're currently uh, extending it uh, to, uh, to make also a very nice comparison to what would happen when you have this, because we have a patch-based based approach. So we do actual, actual uh, pixel classification. Um, so we achieve about the same performance as a 3D uh, spatial temporal unit, um, but that is uh, that unit's not applied on these patches. So we want to compare it to the uh, patch-wise uh, unit as well. Um, so I cannot really say more than, than that for now. Okay. But it will be a uh, work for the near future. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, we have a question for Brennan. Uh, so the question is, can you explain the role of the upper bound on the lesion weights and the stability of the training? Um, sure. So, so with um, some diseases like MS, you have a very wide range of lesion sizes. Um, mm -hmm. So if you just inversely weight um, every lesion as a, as a, if you just use a, a pure inverse weighting strategy, you end up getting um weights that range over signal several or, orders of magnitude for different lesions so like, small lesions might have voxel weights in, in the thousands um and large lesions uh, you know uh, in the low tens so with such a large range of um, uh, lesion weights um, you don't get very good performance and, and training is very unstable um if you if you cut obviously you can that that's sort of a loaded term you can cut the learning rate and um, training ends up being a lot more stable uh, but performance ultimately suffers uh, if you're when you have weights over this sort of range of uh, over several orders of magnitude. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Uh, one last question for Lucas. Uh, so the question is asked that for feeding the unit, the output of the transformer plus the first and the maximum intensity frames were used. Uh, why is it that only the first frame was used and not anything subsequent frames? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, we actually think that the, the first frame is a nice view of the, of the brain. It's, it's a bit like non-contrast uh, CT, so you do not have any um, effect of the contrast agent. and uh, we also experimented it with uh, taking, for example, the sum over the, uh, over time of this scan. So then you have a, uh, the summed intensity and you, you see all the contrast uh, in the brain. Uh, but we found that the, the moment in time where the intensity is at the maximum uh, found to be the, the most helpful in our performance. But of course, you can, uh, you can add uh, many more frames if you, if you, uh, if you want to. Um, but, uh, Thank you. This to be helpful. Uh, one last question for uh, Brennan. Uh, is there a trade-off uh, of performance between segmentation and detection when there is proximity of operating points? Um, so the closer the operating points, uh, the less the trade-off. Um, so, I mean, if you have, if you use the same if you if the same threshold gives you optimal segmentation and detection performance, then naturally the operating points are overlapping. Um, so the optimal operating points are overlapping. So you get optimal performance on both. Uh, so, so yes, um, the closer the operating points, um, the less uh, the less there is of a trade off. Okay. Uh, thank you. So this is uh, like uh, we have running out of time so we'll move on to the next three presenters first one uh, will be with a multi-channel 
uh, input pixel wide regression 3D unit for medical, uh, yeah, yes, for medical uh, uh, image estimation with three applications in brain MRI presented by Yuki Wang. Yuki, are you? Ah, yes. Go ahead, please. Uh, Yuki, we cannot yes. hear you. Yes, we have a problem. We are muted. No, we cannot I still not hear you. Maybe you have to use a different uh, setting in your um, on your side. You still can. Okay. Can you try again? I'm trying again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you can help me now. Yes. Yes. That's Go great. Ahead. Okay. Um, hi everyone. My name is Yuki Wan, and uh, I'm a graduate student at San Frank's Xavier University. In our paper, we propose a multi-channel input pixel-wise regression 3D unit for estimation of medical images. In order to show our model is robust on different tasks, we have applied our model on three different applications. The first is longitudinal image estimation. The second is diffusion image reconstruction. The third is T1 and T2 estimation. We also compare the result of multi-channel to single-channel input in our paper. We can, you can see the result on the right side of the poster. In those three tasks, we actually only change the input number of channel and the bench size while using the same learning rate and other high parameter, the same for each application. The result demonstrates that our unit represents a single deep learning architecture capable of solving a variety of image estimation problems. Thank you for your listening, and uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, paper will be morphology-based losses for weekly supervised segmentation of mammograms, and I will be presented by Mikal Tardi. Mikal? Yeah, um, I'm Michael Charlie, and um, I'm a PhD student at Central Nantes, and I'm working at uh, Hiromi. And uh, we're working with mam mammography, uh, which is a breast X-ray, and uh, we try to segment it. Uh, but we try to segment it without any ground truth uh, uh, for the images. We just know what uh, if there is a cancer or not. So to optimize our neural network that is intended to segment our images, uh, we proposed uh, a new loss, which is based in first on the, the state of the art work, um, which is restricting uh, the size of the findings that we can uh, segment in the images. But since it's not enough and it doesn't allow us to obtain uh, clean uh, segmented images, uh, we propose to include the morphological operators within the lotus. So actually, we propose uh, two uh, new terms, closing and top hat, uh, which will guide uh, the segmentation mask uh, to have uh, fewer but bigger regions and uh, a more convex and uh, less uh, sparse regions everywhere in the breast. So by in the end, uh, we obtain something that does not require a pixel-wise ground truth, uh, but in the same time allows us, as you can see on the picture by number five, obtain uh, the regions that are smaller, compacter, and uh, uh, we have like very much fewer number of false positive activations in the image. Uh, this paper is based on our publication in TMI, so there are plenty of details there. And uh, you're welcome to discuss uh, details of implementation at my poster, which is H8. Thank you.
thank you very much. And the last uh, paper of this block, uh, this session, is a partial convolution network for metal artifact reduction in CTP processing, preliminary results uh, by Laura and Herbert. Hi, yeah, I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, hello, my name is Laura Herwege. I am a PhD candidate at the Institute for Medical Engineering at the University of Lübeck, and I am presenting to you a so-called partial convolution network for metal artifact reduction in computed tomography. Um, as shown in, in this overview, our goal is to reduce metal artifacts in a reconstructed CT image by using a neural network to fill the characteristic metal trace in the projection data. And what is special about the network is that we use the so-called partial convolution instead of normal convolutions to fill these traces. The important aspect about these layers is that we use a binary mask of the metal trace in the patches that identify if the values in the feature maps are valid or not. And for each convolution, we look at the cutout of that mask under the convolution kernel. According to that information, the convolutions are restricted and the convolution result is adjusted by a factor. The network is a unitype network and the partial convolution is used in every second layer and thus the hole in the input data closes step by step. For evaluation, we focus on the differences between the partial convolution network and the conventional convolution one. And the results show that the partial convolution network outperforms the normal CNN. And that difference is not very apparent in the corrected projection data, but after reconstruction, so in the corrected uh, image, the mean performance enhances for the partial convolution network. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, please uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you very much. So I will ask every uh, all the presenters now to the stage and uh, we have some questions from the study groups, but also please use the chat uh, to, to drop any question that you have. So the first one is for Yuki um, and the question is about the Alzheimer disease experiments and uh, it's, uh, the question is why does using M6, M12 perform better than using uh, the original M6 and M12? Um. I guessing this is because we are using um you mean why M6 and M12 have better results than using the three investigator? Oh mm -hmm. okay. Um I actually guessing this is because um uh, uh skill stripping method we are using. There are actually uh, some brand in some skills in their images which making the result like this. This is uh, I guess this is like technique problem for this and uh, yeah, I I do also believe the result using three image to protect should be better, but it just happened like this. Yeah, okay. Yes, it's uh, quite a remarkable result. So I was uh, also wondering about it. And the next question is for uh, Miko and uh, the question is, how did you address the differentiability issue of the loss functions, especially in this morphology is hard to obtain in Python implementation? Thank you. This is a very nice question and uh, many people have been asking it and we actually have been afraid of what will happen because this is tricky. But we uh, used uh, all the operations we used are differentiable. Uh, so in the first place, the output of the segmentation network is still a ReLU. So it's a differentiable. Then we wrapped it in the hyperbolic tangent, which is uh, now uh, bounded by the uh, top. So we obtain the segmentation mask, uh, which are cleaner. And uh, then uh, we have a multiplication coefficient uh, that bring the a higher intensity closer to one. So we have almost binary mask obtained. And the morphology operations are approximated with uh, some pooling combinations, which is still uh, differentiable. And uh, the out, like the whole thing, like with these operators, reproduce uh, at the best the result of morphology operators. Uh, it restricts us a little bit in the types of kernels we can use. Uh, we still didn't find the best way of using like uh, diamond or uh, round shaped kernels very easily. So it's, it's actually a square kernel, but uh, at this point everything is differentiable. So we didn't observe any 
uh, drops in uh, convergence because of that. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I have now a question for Laura. Um, and the question is, uh, how mask images are generated during testing? Oh, sorry, we cannot hear you. Uh, how we generated the mask was the question? Yeah, during testing, yes. During testing? Yes, that's um, the question. So uh, yes, uh, so we uh, what we do is we um, segment the metal uh, object in the first reconstruction um, and then we forward project it and then we use that metal trace for the um, for the uh, testing as well. Okay, thank so you. It's uh, quite it's quite straightforward. Yeah, and uh, just a follow up is uh, did you try your method for different size of metal artifacts? For different sizes? Yes. Um, yes, so we placed uh, a number of metal artifacts inside the anatomies and they are of different sizes. Um, so far, we only used like um, round object and square object and cylindrical objects, um, but we plan on um, yeah, diversifying that a little bit more. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I also have a question now for Yuki. And I was wondering uh, about your uh, longitudinal image uh, reconstruction. What is happening if there is some uh, changes or big changes? Uh, how is your model? Uh, how does your model behave? For example, if there is a, a growth in a lesion or there is an appearance of a, a of an abnormality, have you experienced that? Or that you, uh, you tested? Can you speak the question again? I, I don't think I understand. I'm sorry. Yeah, my question is for the longitudinal image reconstruction. Yeah. Uh, what is happening if uh, uh, there is a, all of a sudden well, there is a growth in, a, in an abnormality and, uh, or there is an appearance of a new abnormality? How does your model behave to reconstruct? Oh, you, the, you mean for the longitudinal image problem? Yes. Or if there suddenly a huge change happen. Yes. So I think for this kind of image generation task, it's actually the model how behave is largely based on the uh, data set distribution. So if there is a sense that very different than what we are training on, then it probably still based on the training problem if we are using like the brand tumor uh, data set on the uh, to in the longitudinal image uh, generation then it probably won't produce a tumor in there mm -hmm. yeah okay. and we have uh, just a question from the chat uh, is uh, do you think your method can be also applied to reconstruction of tracts from diffusion MRI? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not very familiar with the uh, diffusion MI problem. That's uh, the image generation problem is a uh, task of another call author of mine. So I'm sorry, I cannot answer this question. Maybe something to discuss later during the post of all it. A question for uh, Mikkel. Um, are there other possible applications for your model? Maybe not just for the uh, mammogram segmentation of masses. Okay. I think yes. Uh, I think yes. Uh, actually, uh, for any problem where we don't have any ground truth, it will be applicable. Applicable. Uh, it, and uh, the thing is, the mammography is really messy, noisy, and it's hard to be segmented. People are usually doing uh, region detection in it. Uh, which is kind of easier, but there are sometimes findings which are a cluster of macro classifications which we would like to depict in their shape and the region might not represent their shape. So mammography is actually uh, very demanding in this regard, but we still know that there are few but uh, quite bounded regions within it. Uh, so since we have this proof of concept, uh, we may say that it uh, could work for MRI lesions in brain, it could work uh, in 
uh, full CT scans uh, in liver. Uh, however, I think sometimes in uh, in the brain there are simpler things that works already, but uh, morphology could uh, offer additional cleanup of the whole thing, uh, all this denoising where we observe all these uh, useless uh, small activations everywhere in the mask and we would like to get rid of them. So it's like cosmetics job uh, to to make the mask cleaner but still uh, reasonably realistic. Okay, okay, thank you very much. And uh, just the last question uh, for Laura. Um, how can you quantify uh, uncertainty by using the partial convolutional layers since they are similar to dropout? Uh, excuse me, can we repeat the question? Yes. How can you quantify uncertainty by using the partial convolutional layers since they are similar to dropout? Mm, I don't think I understand the question, actually. Um, um that's uh, how i have it here i don't know maybe connor is in the in the uh the attendees and I, he can uh, so what what is confusing me here is uh, that i'm not sure as, like uh i don't understand why it's why it should be similar to dropout layer yeah that's uh seems uh, because of the um uh, partial uh, uh we can say the partial um uh, uh, a sense uh, that it's uh, that it could be the similarity to uh, dropping out some of the uh, some of the, the network. Uh, some, I, I of the, some of the some of the information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. Exactly. Um, That's uh, what I understand, but I don't know. Um, not... Well, in in the dropout layer, you basically uh, voluntarily lose information. But in the partial convolution layer, you don't really have the information anyways. So um, I don't actually think that they are so similar. And I'm not quite sure, I'm, I'm not quite sure what if the question was about accuracy or. No, it was about quantifying uncertainty, quantifying uncertainty. Oh, yeah, um, that is actually a good question. Um, I haven't thought about that yet, but it's a really good question. Okay, I think maybe that's uh, maybe in uh, during gather town. Uh, yeah, they can ask you that idea. Maybe you can uh, maybe, uh, span about the question because we have yeah, to continue thank you very much. To, yeah. to the second block. Uh, yes. Hi, so our next presentation is going to be on a surprising effective parameter based loss for medical image segmentation. And we have Rosanna to present that. We Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hello. So, hi everyone. My name is Rosanna Alzerdi, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Rouen, Normandy. Uh, now, I guess um, most of us or some of us are maybe familiar with the concept of contour-based uh, losses. But those for those who aren't, now contour-based losses, they are generally, they are losses that aim to increase the segmentation performance by minimizing the one-to-one -one correspondence between points on the predicted and labeled contours. Uh, despite their very well-known significance and very valid significance, uh, however, these losses, they are rather complex in nature, they require a lot of time to train, and they underestimate the contour-to-contour -contour distances since uh, they base on distance maps uh, which have this kind of property. Now, to address these limitations, we propose in our work a novel contour-based loss that targets the perimeter length of the organs. Relative to the state of the art, our work carries two main novelties. The first is that instead of the distance maps, we exploit and we propose a novel contour function that can better capture border specifications. 
And secondly, instead of aiming at minimizing the one-to-one -one correspondence, we rather target the perimeter length of organs between predicted and ground truth contours. Now, uh, we validated our loss on multiple data sets of different class modalities. And uh, as a result, we arrived at significant performance for both single and multi-organ segmentation cases, which is honestly quite surprisingly because, surprising because our loss is uh, simply minimizing the mean square error between two scalars corresponding to the perimeter length of the predicted contour and the perimeter length of the uh, ground truth maps. So uh, thank you all for checking out my paper, and I really look forward for your questions. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so our next presentation is going to be on unseen disease detection for deep learning interpretation of X-ray X-rays, and we have Siu to present that. My name is Siu, and together with me, I have Sean today in the panel as well. We are from the Stanford Machine Learning Group. And today we want to present a method for unseen disease detection for deep learning interpretation of chest x-rays. Here you can see on the first slide our setup for the data set where we have chest x-ray images that are labeled include no diseases, three seen diseases, and also six unseen diseases. We trained uh, different data sets uh, to train different models. And you can see here there are four different models with the all diseases model trained with all available information, the any disease model only with the disease versus no disease, and the subset unlabeled model that has unlabeled unseen diseases and subset unseen model that has no example of any unseen diseases. And we feed the model representations that are extracted from these multi-label models into an unseen disease classifier to classify an unseen score to predict in the test set whether there is an unseen disease or not. Um, next slide. Uh, I think it Sorry, will be just on one slide. slide. Uh, okay. I think we uh, just skip the first. There is only one slide for each of the participants. So. Okay. Um, in the so our results that are on shown here, we show that the uh, multi-label models that we trained are able to. Uh, detect the same diseases in a test set than when the test set also has unseen diseases, but they tend to predict the unseen diseases as no disease uh, when there is no seen diseases there. Uh, however, our unseen disease classifiers were able to predict the presence of unseen diseases using just the models uh, representations that are trained from the same diseases. Uh, now we have some time for questions. Mm -hmm. So the first question uh, is for uh, Rosanna. Yes. That uh, do you need the parameter of the object to be segmented for the training? Yes, we need the parameter from both the ground truth and the uh, segmented objects. But luckily, and similar to the paper of H8, we use uh, the contour function uses, uh, um, it's similar to a morphological gradient step uh, where we extract these contours via max and min pooling and ReLU layers. So it's also differentiable. Uh, and these layers are non-trainable, so they're quite efficient and fast to compute and to, to extract online. Okay, thank you. Uh... Uh, so follow-up question for that. In your morphological operator, there was a ReLU layer used. So yes. can you give you can you give us the significance of why do you need ReLU layer? Yes. Well, ReLU layers they're supposed to um, delete any kind of noise that they're carrying around the object. Uh, but for our uh, implementation, uh, since we are basically, uh, since the object is rather growing and um, uh, and not leaving some kind of uh, any uh, noise around it, it's not really that necessary. But uh, since uh, my, my con the contour function proposed, it is inspired by one of the valid papers of uh, the skeleton loss. If I, if if anyone is familiar with it, we wanted to 
preserve or to respect the implementation that is uh, that is presented by the paper and that is why we have kept the relu, the relu uh, function but our loss could very well work without a relu in our uh, in our implementation of course okay thank you so we have a question for cu so the question is uh, that non-parametric bootstrap involves sampling with replacement for the observed data. Uh, so what is the model, total number of observations, means the total number of test samples multiplied by total number of models? Uh, I'll give that question to my co-author, Ishan. Yeah, I can take that out. Um, so we have a total of four models and we do um, um, bootstrap differences. So you can imagine two models each um, for the differences. And there are about 500 test samples um, for the test sets. Um, that's where we compute the AUCs and metrics on. Um, and for the bootstrap replicate, we use about 1,000 um, replicas. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so a question for uh, Rosanna. Uh, so uh, do you think that your loss could be applicable for segmentation of pathology? like multiple sclerosis, brain tumors, or ischemic stroke? Um, in, the, in its current form, no, because uh, through my experiments, one, uh, this the proposed loss is rather sensitive a bit to multi-connected components. Whenever there are multi-connected components, the efficiency of the proposed loss is not very optimal um because it just it tends to you know favor the uh, the segmentation of only one instance um so in the current form no but we do believe that there are a lot of potential uh that this loss has and with proper customization it might be able at some point to to accommodate uh, multiple sclerosis and so on and so forth uh, so a follow-up question on that uh, looking at your qualitative results it seemed like uh, all of the methods are under segmenting the structure because the segmentation boundaries are inside the ground truth mask so do yes. you have any comments on that that why that might be the case um it's not that you mean the pictures the qualitative results yeah qualitative results. okay these are some of the failure points or the failure cases where the contra-based losses they might uh, they might not segment the organs uh, as much as possible which is quite in, uh, quite um logical because as i said distance maps they tend to underestimate the boundaries and the boundary specifications this is not the case with the uh, with the contour based loss because there is an accurate delineation and and uh, and specification of these boundaries uh, and that is why probably the proposed loss works better than than those of the contour based losses but i should note that these are just uh, examples exemplar failures they don't represent the entire uh, validation set and the entire testing uh, images so of course there are images uh, where contour based losses works well uh, we don't uh, we don't claim that contour losses they are like they, they always under segment for instance okay thank you so we have a question for uh, see you and ishan that do you have an indicator of how different the disease could be like how have you had a chance to work with the covid data to work with the what? Have you had a chance to work with COVID data? Do you think that your work could be applicable with COVID data? And can it be, because COVID data is an unseen disease, right? So can it be applicable for that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think that was actually one of the motivators uh, that I thought about as well. Unfortunately, we don't have currently in our hands a uh, chest x-ray that it exemplify COVID data, uh, but that could be a very good test set to test as an external test set as well. So if you are interested in collaborating, feel free to shoot us an email as well. Thank you. And a rather unusual question for this, but maybe you can uh, answer that. Can, can this method uh, for access, assessing unseen cases be considered for inverse imaging problems? Do you think that it can be, I'm not sure what do that mean by that, but um, I, I can try and take that up. I'm assuming that means denoising and image augmentation reconstruction yep. things like that. Um, to some extent, yes. I think the feature representations, because they're an image prior, um, they can be for reconstruction. Um, that's an interesting area of research. And um, 
theoretically, the feature representations for the models that have been exposed to unseen diseases, even though they've not been labeled, will have that um, latent information into the penultimate layer. Um, and that could be used for, for reconstruction. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there's any um, reconstruction loss and what kind of reconstruction losses really creep in. Um, things like hallucination, things like that. There's actually an interesting session thing right before this um, for reconstruction. Um, I don't know the papers talked about um, how unseen diseases um, can or cannot be reconstructed. Um, so it's definitely an interesting area of research and um, theoretically, yes, the future events can be used. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so we are running out of time. Thank you for all the presenters. So just a reminder that we have a poster session just after that. So feel free to drop by uh, poster sessions and ask your questions. Everybody.